Um, so I'm Nigel Parker. I'm a web and mobile uh, developer from Microsoft in New Zealand, and I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes giving you the insight to the five things you need to know to start using video and audio today. I wanted to start off by just calling out the fact that there is two new tags in HTML5. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory, really. There's a video tag and an audio tag. And the similarities between the two is that you've got a source element, which is pointing to the source of your video. For video, you have a width, a height, and a poster image. And the poster image is really going to display uh, until the video is ready or the first frame is there to uh, play back on your, on, your, on your site. There's some other attributes as well, like preload, which says whether the video starts downloading automatically or whether you just get the metadata to know the length of the video or the resolution. Uh, autoplay is obvious, it's as it says. Looping will loop the video. And this interesting one down here, controls. If you include controls, it's going to actually show the browser's native play pause, scrub bar, volume controls for both audio and video. I'll get into this a little bit later. I wanted to start by setting the scene about uh, what HTML5 video and audio is good for today and what it isn't. So my background is actually working uh, with Silverlight Media and Silverlight uh, broadcasters. I've also been working on HTML5 uh, video for the last little while. And it's really good when it comes to being part of the DOM, actually getting access to script elements, uh, CSS, some of the new components of HTML5 like Canvas, and having it as a first-class citizen inside your web page. What it's not good for, today there's actually no way to protect um, HTML5 video or audio, so there is no rights management with this stuff. There's also some workarounds in regards to universal full screen. I'll get onto that a little bit later in the talk, but there isn't a way to actually play video full screen across the board currently. And also the last one, there's actually no way to do live streaming or adaptive streaming within the HTML5 spec. Now, if you're an iPad or an iPhone user, you might be sitting there going, well, I've actually done live streaming or adaptive streaming using HTML5 video uh, for a few years now. And what you're probably referring to there is a thing called Apple's HLS, or HTTP Live Streaming Protocol. It's worth calling out that this is actually not part of HTML5 uh, in the specification. And there is no current spec for adaptive streaming. It's also not part of an industry standard, but it is something that uh, companies are adopting or building solutions for like our own uh, transform manager for doing smooth streaming to Apple devices. There is work being done by a group called 3GPP and MPEG who are proposing a standard called DASH, which is actually stands for Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP, and that's being submitted to numerous standard bodies at the moment, including W3C, for consideration for an adaptive streaming spec. If it is standardized, Microsoft, uh, Alex was saying in his media session yesterday, that we're going to move the smooth streaming, uh, adaptive streaming, towards the Dash spec and implement it that way. Moving on that topic, uh, video audio codecs when it comes to HTML5 video and audio. The spec doesn't, act, doesn't specify what codecs you need to use. And what I've done here is create a bit of an eye chart of the most popular audio codecs and also the most popular video codecs that are used out there on the web today. I've also got across the top the latest versions of the browsers, which all support audio and video tags. And you'll notice there's a few uh, ab abnormalities in my design, namely the exclamation mark next to Chrome. So today, Chrome does support AAC audio and H.264 video, but they've announced that they're going to be removing support for that over future versions. If you look at IE9, there is an asterisk next to our WebM support. And the reason for that is we're not going to ship the codec or the container, but if you want to install the add-on for WebM video inside IE9, you can do that through the test drive site and get WebM video and audio working uh, inside of IE9. If you are paying attention to that, you probably come to the realization that you're going to need more than one codec and more than one container to do both audio and video using HTML5. And furthermore, you may actually need a higher resolution and a lower resolution version of your video file on each codec as well. 
It's especially true if you want to serve mobile devices or go over 3G or Wi-Fi mobile networks. And unfortunately, this is unlikely to change anytime soon. If I was standing here a year ago, I would have said H.264. It was what the industry was uh, standardizing on, and all of the main browsers and were really you know, generating around H.264. YouTube, with the uh, WebM Foundation, has actually moved in another direction there with their acquisition of ON2 and the VP8 codec. And what YouTube is doing currently is they're re-encoding every video on, U uh, sorry, Google, every video on YouTube into WebM as well as H.264. So it's a massive job, but it's something that they've started and been working on uh, for more than a year. Having a look at the markup for doing HTML5 video, you'll notice I've got the video tag here with the uh, controls element to show the browser's default, default controls. Inside of that is the source element with the source to the video file. It's important to put the MIME type and the codec that you're using uh, after the source file. The reason for that is it's going to save time and it means the browser's not going to need to download too much of your video to work out if it's going to be able to play it. It will actually read that first. I know in uh, Thomas's previous session he talked about CSS media queries. There's a good opportunity to use device width to identify if it's to serve the high resolution video or whether to fall back to the next line and serve a low resolution video to mobile devices which don't have a screen size that can meet the high resolution content. Uh, in addition to that, you can then fall on to another video format which is supported by the rest of the browsers. So in this case it could be OGV or WebM format and follow the same approach for a full black between high resolution and mobile devices. It's really worth stressing here, if anything you put in between after that source uh, element, that's the fallback contact content that's going to be used by older browsers. So, for example, if you've got Silverlight, Flash, YouTube in there, it'll be rendered on IE8, IE7 previous versions. But if you don't provide a codec, if the browser understands video and audio and you don't provide a codec that it can play, it'll never get to that fallback code it will just um, not execute. So you need to be aware of that and uh, code accordingly. The next thing I wanted to touch on was just encoding optimizations. So I've already talked about multiple formats and multiple resolutions. So you may be thinking, well, how can I get this done efficiently without investing in too much hardware or encoding on my own side? There are a number of companies that are starting to pop up that do encoding to the cloud. Uh, Archive.org and encoding.com are two that I've tried. And what they'll do is you upload your original format, you provide some profiles for web video, they will then render those and either put them up to another cloud storage site uh, or back to your machine for local hosting. If we're talking about cloud storage, uh, if you're using blob storage with Windows Azure right now, you can actually get your video up there and then you can use the CDN or the content delivery network to distribute that out to your users. One thing that's worth saying is uh, when you upload a video file, it's probably not going to have the correct MIME, site set, MIME type set against it. It might be application octet or just some sort of binary data. So using a tool like Azure Storage Explorer or other tools, it's important to go in there and set the correct MIME type for the file that you upload to the cloud storage. Because if you don't do that, the browsers will not necessarily play your video because it's a security problem to have uh, different content to the MIME type that you're specifying. Another thing to think about is HTTP 1.1 compatible web servers. And the reason that this is important is it enables you to do things like seeking ahead in your video. If you upload a video that's an hour long or an hour and a half long, chances are the user might want to go to the end of that clip and hasn't downloaded all the content that's come before it. So you need a, a web server which is compatible with that to do byte range requests, which I'll show, show shortly. If you're using IIS, you can add media services, and you can do things like bitrate th uh, throttling as well to save yourself on bandwidth. So with all of that talking, let's uh, get to a demo. So I've actually built an MVC3 site, uh, HTML5 MVC3 site, using the uh, stuff that Scott Hanselman was showing in the keynote. And I've hosted this out on uh, Windows Azure using an extra small instance. So it's a test harness that you can actually go and check out after the, the talk. You'll notice I've given it a domain name there as well, video.stickon.me. And what you'll see here, this is just the standard markup as I was showing in the slide. 
And this video is one that I've uh, shot on my digital camera and then uploaded to archive.org as a, a hosting site. If we have a look at this video, it's playing back inside of the tag. Uh, it's, forming, it's, it's returning two media sources, so an MP4 source and then it's falling to an OGV video. And down here I'm getting an access to the video and setting the volume, so video.volume equals one, and you'll notice that that's the uh, volume being set programmatically by my example here. If I was to click onto this example, this is actually using local IIS. Now what you'll notice is that I've got the missing image type cross over my video. And the reason for this is that by default, IIS doesn't know about the MIME types for MP4, WebM, and OGV video. So either you're going to have to go in and add those MIME types, or do this through your web config file. And if you add that MIME type, MP4, I can change that to video-MP4. And now if I was to come back and reload my example, refresh my page here, it's now going to identify and play that video back based on the uh, correct MIME type. If you're on shared hosting, you might need to do this through web config. Uh, down here, another thing that is offered with IAS Media Services is this bitrate throttling. If you look at bitrate throttling, what it gives you the opportunity to do is change the settings based on different types of media files. So for example, for MP4, I can say download as much as quickly as possible to get the first 10 seconds of my video, and then only download at the encoded bitrate, so you're not serving more video than the uh, user is going to watch. This is especially important if people just leave things on the page and you download all the content, but they actually never end up watching what you're serving them. Uh, coming back into the demo here, this is a long run video, it's actually a video of my presentation here uh, being served from Blob Storage in Windows Azure. If I start playing this one back, you'll notice if I try and drag to the end of the video, it's not going to work because it hasn't actually downloaded that much content yet. If I was to come over to the same video hosted at IIS, I'll press F12 and bring up the uh, development tools for IE9 and start a network trace here. And if I start playing this video and then scroll in to say 10 minutes into my video, what you'll notice over here is that it's made a request to the web server and it's requested a, a byte range using of the video element. So it's calling this MP4 video element, it's HTTP 1.1 compatible and it's asked for, to seek only from this part in the video. So what's going to be returned from the server is a chunk of video continuing from that point in time. Now this is going to work from uh, different browsers as well and different video types. So if I was to load uh, Firefox 4 here and bring up the same example, I'm now playing it back and I'm dragging forward and actually moving forward in the video as well. And this time this is the OGV video as opposed to the H.264. So you can see that approach really for video syncing is um, something that you need to consider or is quite important. I like this image. This is, this is probably one of the photos in the deck that's not my own, but um, when you're talking about HD video and HD video on the web, it's hard to see through all of the BS. A lot of people come out and say, well, we support HD video, but then they don't qualify that with what actually HD video means. Is it 1080p? Is it 720p? Is it 10 frames per second? Is it 60 frames per second? Are we talking about 2 megabits per second or 20 megabits per second? So when we talk about HD video on the web, it doesn't actually have any meaning anymore. It just means that you're playing back video that, that kind of looks good to your users. And an example of this is as we start to build for higher pro, uh, processor machines or machines that can do GPU encoding, we're also going to run into issues uh, potentially where we have netbooks, battery powered machines or machines doing software encoding. This is an example of a video, this is a screenshot I took from Chrome uh, doing software encoding on H.264. And if you notice here, uh, just look down there, you'll notice there's some corruption elements in the video. And this is quite normal when the uh, decoder starts to drop intermediary or reference frames. And as the video is playing, we start to see this blocking lines or, or this sort of corruption. So as a uh, web developer, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Apologize for this. Let's close my presentation.
you might be asking yourself, are there encoding settings that you can use to reduce this sort of corruption? Now, luckily enough, the answer is yes, but you need to have awareness over the problem in the first instance. When we talk about H.264 as a codec, H.264 was actually designed to handle the continuum from low-powered machines right through to high-end GPU encoding um, down on the client. And when they designed it, they designed three profiles, something called a baseline profile, a main profile, and a high profile as well. The baseline is for the battery-powered devices, results in a larger file, it's uh, less computing power to decode, and it's actually quicker to encode. Uh, through to the high end, it's a smaller file, there's more CPU to decode, and it's longer to encode. Uh, the main profile I, I would steer clear of these days, because pretty much any device or machine that can decode in the main profile can also decode in the high profile. And it's the same level of complexity on the client to actually decode that video. One other thing that's worth mentioning is that Microsoft Expression Encoder 4 provides the facility to start to work with these different types of uh, encoding modules. So if I, if I bring that up and have a look at uh, Microsoft Expression Encoder 4, what you'll notice here is that this is actually a one minute video from my digital SLR camera, and it's 145 megs. So it's a real HD uh, 1080p 20 megabit per second file. And when you come into Expression Encoder 4, there's a bunch of these sort of presets that you can apply. This one here is H.264 for YouTube. And when you apply that uh, prefix, it's going to actually create uh, a bunch of MP4 settings for you. Down here, as I mentioned before, I would recommend moving between main and high and actually going with the high setting um, as opposed to using main. Down here inside of the uh, video, uh, CBR one pass, that means it's a constant bit rate. If you've got parts of your video which are moving quickly and other parts which are quite static, like during a presentation with demos, I'd recommend going to a VPR um, constrained approach where you're actually using a variable bit rate and you have a peak bit rate which is higher than the average bit rate for the video. So let's say our average bit rate is maybe 700 kilobytes, but we will peak right up to three megabits if we have lots of stuff happening on the screen at a particular point in time. Uh, we're downgrading the uh, video from 1080p to 720p here. So what that means is that we should not letterbox, we should actually stretch that video uh, as we're making it smaller. And if you click down here, there's a bunch of advanced settings as well that you can use for the profiler. We can increase the number of uh, reference frames that are being created inside of the video, moving that up to probably five. And this thing here called B frames, this is the bi-directional predictive frames that sit in between those reference ones. And the more of these that you have, the smaller your file size and the more efficient it is for seeking uh, across your video. So we'll increase that up to three. And one thing that I'll mention down here, it's really important when you do that to actually remove your reference B frames. So what this will do is it enables the decoder to actually drop those intermediary frames, uh, sorry, those bidirectional frames, if it's having struggled um, decoding your video. And that will avoid the corruption that I was showing earlier. And if we use the Hadamard transform, uh, this is slightly higher compression rate and will reduce your file size even further. So this is just one approach to uh, tweaking those video settings, but providing these profiles and actually applying them to each of the video as you go along can improve the experience for your users. Okay, styling with Canvas. Um, Canvas and CSS are two great ways of actually creating the creative experiences with video. So I know you saw in the keynote the examples with the Canvas video being played back. Uh, I just wanted to show you a demo of this as well. Now what I want to demo is this amazing fireworks site from Beauty of the Web. One of the interesting parts about this is that because these videos all need to be downloaded, it's really hard to keep them all in sync. So if we have a look behind to see what's happening, you'll notice it's one MP4 that's being brought down, and it's full of all the video tracks. And then what's happening is that we're cutting this video up um, using Canvas and playing it out and allowing the user to interact with the video. Why might you want to be able to do this? Well, think, for example, you're watching me with a recording of my laptop here, but you might be hearing the cicadas in the background. 
So if you click that uh, little button over to the side of the video, click it now. Hey there. Now you're getting more information about the environment that I'm actually recording this in. Hello, there's another camera over here. And as the user, you're able to click between cameras and presentation and get that feedback. So what we're doing there is actually taking a um, single video which contains multiple camera angles and cutting that up using Canvas. So the approach to do this is actually have a video element that brings in the full video and auto plays or, or, or plays back as soon as um, it is, it's loaded. And then using a Canvas and using a div display none, I actually hide that video element. Then using Canvas, what I'm doing is showing the clipping of that video. And then I initialize that on loaded metadata. And what I do is get the element from that canvas, and I call a, another method called process frame for every 33 milliseconds or 30 times a second. And then I paint that video onto the canvas to create that video effect. So when I'm clicking those buttons on the left of the screen to change between close-up, uh, screen, and resolution, what I'm effectively doing is providing different clipping and replaying that onto the canvas. So if we have a look at some demos using this, uh, my favorite demo here is this one which actually uh, does the ambilight out the back of a video playing back. So when you play back this video, I don't know if you've seen this with the TVs, but it analyzes the video and then plays the dominant colors out the left and the right of the video frame using that canvas effect or that canvas element. Now if you're a designer in the room, you might be wondering, why we don't do this using CSS, because it's probably more effective to just do that sort of clipping uh, using a CSS element. With CSS and border radius and, bo and box shadow, these sort of effects are now quite standard across the current set of browsers. But one interesting thing that you may not realize is that when you're working against video element, the border radius and box shadow is not, is not applied to the native players on some of these browsers. IE9 and Firefox um, do as you would expect, but the other browsers uh, show the boxing behind the image, but don't actually clip the playing video. So if we have a look at this demo, this is the CSS um, drop shadow and border radius being applied to that uh, playing video there. So until we get some consistency in this approach, we're actually going to struggle to find a way of doing that sort of clipping natively with CSS. And the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, was the styling with custom controls. This is the same image I showed before with the browser's default controls. And what you'll notice is that each default set of default controls is actually different. They look different, they operate differently, they've all got a pause play button, a scrub bar, volume control, but they're not the same thing. And you notice with the IE9 one, when the video is actually small, the controls change to just the play and a pause. They don't give you the uh, area of doing scrubbing when you can't actually reach in there to grab the, the handle. So there are some translations that go on. So what you might want to do is uh, create your own custom skin, skinnable players and apply those to the video so you get a consistent experience across all the browsers that you actually want to work within. Now there's some common media elements, play, pause, load, can play type. Can play type will identify whether it can play the codec. Load will, is important because you call load if you change the media source while it's playing. And you can add these event listeners to the methods to create the custom players. So if I was to have a look at uh, what that comes out like, so an example here with some custom controls. Play back the video. You notice the playhead's moving along and the video's playing back. If I have a look at the source of this video. There's the methods that are being applied. Uh, the listeners that are being applied for play, pause, ended, progress, uh, pr duration change as the video's being downloaded, time updates and then the methods that are being applied to write against those um, events. And I can do things like grabbing this, moving it back, playing and pausing. So those are some of the custom player controls that you can use. There is a lot out there. I just came up with this uh, example, so, sorry, 
Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is about going full screen. So I mentioned before that the spec doesn't support full screen, and the reason for that is there's some, still there's some debate about what happens when you actually come out of the browser uh, scheme and take over the desktop. So the spec specifically says you can't pop out and go full screen, but there are workarounds that you can apply inside of your code. So there's a library that's been created by the Opera developers called videofullscreen.js, and if you have a look at this uh, library, what this does is it takes the playing video element, and when you press Shift and Enter or F11, it actually repaints that playing element full screen and pops the browser out into its full screen mode. Now this is an approach that you can use in the interim until we get to a position where the player controls can actually break out of that sandbox model and take over the, the display. And one more thing before I move on. There is a lot of players that are being built by the community today. And all of these players have a bunch of different licenses, a bunch of different script libraries, and they do a whole load of different things, whether it's related to fallback or, um, or playback. The source for this is something called Videos, Video S, SWS. And I've been out and tried a whole bunch of these custom players. Some of my favorite ones are here. Anyone familiar with uh, Flash will know about JW Player. They've also got an HTML5 version with fallback to Flash that you can use. I like Leanback Player because it's got all the accessibility and keyboard features that you might like to put against your video. Media Element JS is another one that uh, I've tried here. And the one that I find really interesting is Sublime Video because what they offer is player as a service. And why I quite like the idea of player as a service is that they're going to worry about bugs. They're going to worry about browser changes and all of those things that might actually occur. And all you do is subscribe to that player and include it down inside of your uh, web application. So if we have a look at a demo of Sublime Video Player, this site enables you to test all the different players and to try them uh, with your own video content. And now we're playing out in Sublime Video. I right click, I can switch between HTML5 and Flash. I'm now in Flash with the same uh, look and feel or experience. If I go back to HTML5, it remembers your volume settings from previous times you've come in here. And it also supports going full screen or full window, hiding your controls, bringing them back, scrubbing, coming out of uh, full screen mode. So I definitely recommend going and having a look at um, some of the players that have been built out there as well. I know 25 minutes is not a very long time to get through all of this stuff, but I do encourage you to go to the ietestdrive.com site and try out the video demos and install the WebM codec as well into your browser. We launched yesterday a new media platform site on Microsoft.com that brings together our end-to-end -end media story, including HTML5. And my own site, uh, nigelparker.name, I'm going to post all my demos and my code, uh, as well as a video of the session up here later today, if you want to go and try it out for yourself and have, have a go at the demos. So thank you very much. Uh, remember to do the evals. HTM12 is the code for this session. And enjoy your break and come up, and I'll take questions afterwards.